Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today with Future Armenians Initiative and the Yerevan State Medical University. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. We have a special occasion today. The event is going to be in English, but there is a simultaneous translation. So please use the interpretation button so that you can start hearing the words in Armenian. خنترم می‌ماند که های رنوف همه جامانه که هر کمانو چون که یه تک سخم یک اینترپریتیشن کوچک کارو کل سلای سامنه های رنوف. A few words about me. It's my pleasure to be with you today. My name is Vartuhi Petrosian. I am the dean of Turpanjian School of Public Health at the American University of Armenia, and today my role is to be a moderator. for a very interesting discussion about the Future Armenian Initiative. It's a public initiative launched by Armenians and friends of Armenia to create a common framework of understanding around the sustainable development of Armenia as a country and Armenians as a nation. This was initiated by a group of 10 people, the names of some of them you have already seen, And it's a pleasure to know that Dr. Nubar Afian and Ruber Vartanian are among them. As part of this collective initiative, a list of 15 goals, uh, goals have been developed with inputs from more than 300 individuals. There have been in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with them before developing these interesting goals. You can find a list of the goals on the website, thefuturearmenian.com. It will be provided to you in the chat. More than 15,000 people have already joined the initiative. And the initiative group includes very well-known names, such as Nicolas Aznavour from Armenia, uh, Agaro Armen, USA, Levon Aronian, Armenia, etc. You can find the complete list on the website. Uh, and today, it's a special occasion as one of the co-initiators are with us, Dr. Nubar Athean, who is the founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering, a company that conceives, creates resources and develops first in category life science platform, companies to transform human health, thinking about important concepts such as sustainability. So today, uh, Dr. Afian is going to talk to you briefly, after which we will be open for questions. Although many of the students have already provided their questions, but you can continue being engaged and provide us with more questions via chat in the Zoom. So please. Contact us via Zoom and Dr. Afian will try to answer everyone's questions. Dr. Afian, it's my pleasure uh, to have this meeting with you and the floor is yours. Shanagarachun Vartuhi, Bokchun Polorit, Anklerenov Bisharnagem, Kone Arachin Koskeres, Yedevet Kelagarnam, Orosh Hartseru, Arenov Balaskanin. It's a pleasure to be here with, with all of you and Thanks for paying some attention to this initiative. Um, what I will do in the beginning is just use a few slides to outline where we came from and where we're hoping to go. So let me just, by, by, by way of background, I'd like to kind of take you back 20 years. Uh, probably most of you were quite, quite young at the time in the audience, if you're in medical school now. Uh, but 20 years ago, Uh, together with Ruben Vartanian and many other colleagues, we started an initiative called Armenia 2020. Uh, and it was an initiative aimed at envisioning the future alternatives that Armenia faced. Uh, you have to go back to 2000 and realize this was a time when the internet was born, when the world was going through a pretty significant change. Um, certainly many of the uh, uh, former Soviet countries were increasingly integrating with Europe uh, in terms of their economies and their societies. And it was a different time and we could look ahead and say, okay, how can Armenia find its place in the world? And these are some of the kinds of questions that we started asking. By we, I mean Armenians all over the world, diaspora in Armenia, 
and we gathered them together and had a series of, of uh, intense two-day meetings that produced quite a bit of content. We uh, commissioned research, so social research, economic research, and finally, <clears throat> we got to a place where we were able to present our findings. One of the key areas that I just want to take from that, from those days, is just to, I mean, I know you're, many of you are in Armenia listening, and, and, and of course, that's the view that is shown here. But of course, Armenians are occupying the whole world these days and living in many places, the majority being outside of Armenia. And it's not only just one diaspora, but of course, we know that there are dozens and dozens of diasporas, very heterogeneous, totally different mindsets, different habits. So when you're talking about the future Armenian, you have to view this in a, in a bit more uh, particular way. And then, of course, you have to think about the element of time because the, the future Armenian at some level is influencing the present thinking. And I would say as Armenians, we are largely defined by our past, uh, certainly inf inf heavily defined by Armenia, the diaspora has a smaller role, but a, but a role. And of course, the future has, I would argue, historically had a very small role. This was our view back 10, 15 years ago. I'm showing you slides from a presentation that I gave in 2006. Um, and I say all that because it led us to the following conclusions. And then I will tell you about what we're doing today, so many years later. <clears throat> our sense was that we have a historic opportunity with a homeland that is uh, uh, self-determining and free, in quotations, in that obviously we have some realities we dealt with, we dealt with back then, but essentially we were given a chance to elect governments, and, and uh, there were a lot of issues that needed to be taken on, very difficult issues. Uh, an important one of that was how could we think about including the diaspora as a competitive advantage of Armenia, something we've talked about for a long, long time. And for especially the diaspora and Armenians who are disconnected with Armenia in the future, the, the question that we asked is, you know, everybody would ask us, why should I get involved? How can I get involved? Because I'm no expert. And the point is that nobody is an expert in developing a startup country. Armenia was, still is a startup country and, and, and it's everybody's job and nobody's job at the same time to think about what can we become. And the key is, we always ask others to care for us. The, we want our, our allies, our supporters, the international uh, financial institutions to support us. But the key is if we, if we don't get engaged, it's a little difficult to ask why are others being engaged. So this was the mood, this was the uh, thought process that led us down a set of initiatives. And what, what started out as Armenia 2020 became the Competitiveness Foundation of Armenia, uh, some 10 years ago, this was a formal government private sector partnership that operated for a number of years and took several initiatives in the economic and social sectors. That led to the formation of the IDEA Foundation, which was largely a social impact development entity through which projects like the UWC Dilijan College, the Datev uh, 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 Aerial Tramway, and many other initiatives were undertaken. Um, we created more recently the Foundation of Armenian Science and Technology, all rooted in the original thinking that came out of the Armenia 2020 project. And then finally, in order to have Armenia find a place in the global humanitarian sphere, we, on the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, formed the initiative that led to the Aurora Prize, which is an international prize uh, focused on identifying, honoring, and presenting to the whole world people who are heroically saving the lives of others in, in, in honor of those who saved Armenian lives 100 years ago. These initiatives all were part of a narrative of how Armenia can move forward and progress. But obviously, it was not enough. These were individual projects looking to see where, where there may be a collaboration, where there may be a future. Now, last year obviously was a very difficult year. I must say in 2001, when we set our sights on the year 2020, none of us had such a difficult year in mind and we couldn't have. We could not have foreseen a pandemic. We could not have foreseen the extreme political uh, strife and uncertainty 
uh, that existed before the, the, the Artsakh uh, conflict and war and, and certainly after. And so, you know, one of the things you think about about the future is that there's no one future. There are several alternative futures and you have to be ready for all of them. And so even while you may want to design and work towards a desirable future, you also have to foresee elements that outside of your control uh, have to be counteracted with, with strategies. And that's really what spurred us to think about the future Armenian project as <clears throat> at least something we could do as a network of Armenians and the diaspora in Armenia to begin to shift the narrative towards not just our present difficulties, which are many, but also to give a voice to the future. Um, I work, as some of you will know, in the world of innovation and entrepreneurship. And innovation and entrepreneurship is all about anticipating a future and making it real. And, and, and that is no less important in developing a country. Uh, and understandably, the, the present makes us forget the future, not only the past, but the future, especially when it's a painful present. But if we are going to forget the future, or at least the possibilities of the future, then I'm afraid we're condemned to the present. And so what, however bad it is, however uh, uh, hopeless it seems in some corners, I would argue that the most valuable thing that the collective can do is to engage in a dialogue about which future and why we choose a future and how can we then work together to achieve it. You might view it as idealistic. I don't know what our alternative is. And so that's the spirit in which we have formed this initiative really on behalf of the open public. This is not a political uh, uh, undertaking. This is not an, a personal undertaking. It's not private, it's not, it's everything. It's basically just, let's just be able to focus some of our uh, activities around what will, what will a five-year-old today want us to have done today, looking back 20 years from now, and can we anticipate that? And can we serve that goal versus simply what do I do to get votes today or what do I do to advance my interest today? So the initiative was launched around 15 goals that were modeled after the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We set out as a, a phase one objective, bringing together 10,000 people who were signatories and, 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 and people who agreed with the general notion and wanted to engage. Uh, we set a second goal of reaching 30,000, of which I'm happy that we're well, well over 15,000 today. And, and you might ask, why do we need so many people to get involved? Why don't we just find 500 smart people and let's just get going? And one of the learnings uh, that Ruben and I and others have had in the last 20 years is that much as we have ex expended resources, brought experts to Armenia, done a lot of work, without a broad engagement with these initiatives, our conclusion is that it's very, very difficult for the country and for the diaspora to embrace it as significant and, 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 and kind of something to really be, be, be uh, uh, partners in. Um, we, we think that going forward without popular engagement and support by the people whose lives this affects, it's not worth doing. And so we, we've heard the political discourse in Armenia, we understand the power of support and we are thinking rather than uh, getting involved in the process of governance, which really should be left to folks that are in government or want to be in government, nevertheless, ideas also benefit from popular support. And we are here to present 15 general directions around which we hope new ideas will attract group support and engagement. With that in mind and keeping in mind that I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to just flash up this slide. I really hope all of you have gone to the website and studied these uh, 15 goals. Um, they are broken down into five slides. I will not read them. Just to point out that <clears throat> some of the topics have to do with the importance, vital importance of setting a, a goal, a vision collectively. We cannot have different people with totally different visions of the future all spending their resources to make that future happen because we don't have enough resources. If we cannot collectively generally agree on what kind of country this is going to become, then we will be able to have a 10% chance at 10 different countries, none of them we will like because we will not have a critical mass. 
So it's super important to work collectively to set a vision. Um, of course, our sovereignty has now been threatened, uh, not only in Artsakh, but in Armenia. And we need to certainly move that aspect of the narrative to the center. Clearly, we assumed certain things over the last decades that were not uh, uh, able to test to, to stand up to tests. And we need to move this <coughs> ocean of how, notion of how are we going to defend ourselves uh, central to any discussion we're having. Um, the third bullet you might be surprised is so important to us is that we need to stay relevant to the world. And among the many ways in which we can be relevant is to recognize that we have gone through a genocide, we have gone through a set of experiences that are meaningful today. The world today, especially after this pandemic, is suffering. It's suffering the way Armenians have been suffering for the last 100 years. Four million people will have died by the time this pandemic begins to resolve. Tens of millions of them have been sick and will be sick for a very long period of time based on the medical information that I see. Uh, we have gone through this journey. We've gone through <clears throat> the feeling of senseless death and trying to recover. And I think that it's <clears throat> really important as Armenians that we stand up to that, to the, to the responsibility our history gives us to help others cope with this type of distress, this type of trauma. And you might say, well, what do they have to learn from Armenians? My answer to you is everything, because very few people have gone through the kind of trauma we've survived. And I think that's an important voice that we should not lose. <clears throat> the, the other topics have to do with the central importance of gaining some certainty around Artsakh's physical security and its legal status. I know that these days, this is an extremely uncertain situation, very, very concerning, and it all happened very quickly. We need to continue to work towards ensuring a status, a version of recognition that allows us to move towards a brighter future. This uncertainty is in and of itself a, a, a very debilitating situation. Vis-a-vis -vis the diaspora, you know, we, <clears throat> we continuously talk about the diaspora of Armenia being a form of natural resource. And, you know, Baku has oil and Yerevan has a diaspora. Well, I must say that Baku uses its oil a lot better than Yerevan uses its diaspora. And, and I say that as a diasporan Armenian committed for 20 years. I've been in Armenia at least five times a year for during that whole time, other than this last year. And, 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 and of course, there's goodwill in the diaspora and there's a lot of interest, but there is no mutualism and there's very little trust. And it's disappointing to me after all these years. Individual projects have, have been successful, but collective action and a dialogue which is based on the understanding that both sides need each other. One might be an elected government, one might be a heterogeneous group of people, but the resources, the networks that they can bring to bear will not be simply used. They will have to be partnered with. And this is to me a very, very big issue that uh, having a ministry or having an office is not going to deal with directly. We need to have a serious discussion about the strategic role that a diaspora can play and should play. And I know there are elements in Armenia that are vociferously against any formal role of the diaspora. And that's a very legitimate view. I happen to think it's the wrong view for a brighter future, but it may be a very right view for a status quo present, which, which some people benefit from. So I think that's an important discussion. We also have to keep in mind that the diaspora needs to be strengthened. We are weakening on a daily basis because the, the, the main objectives we had, which were the preservation of the Armenian identity when we did not have an independent country and the recognition of the genocide, both of those issues are actually, fortunately, less crucial right now. The preservation of the Armenian identity will be done much more through Armenia in the future than through the diaspora. Of course, diaspora can continue to do that, but it's not like we're gonna disappear. On the other hand, the genocide recognition, again, progress. We need to put new emphasis on strengthening the diaspora. And the only topic I think the diaspora can really be strengthened by is a commitment towards building a strong future in Armenia. That's why I say if the diaspora has no role in building that future, well, then it's really hard to keep the diaspora strong because what are they going to be strong with? Watching films, you know, being tourists, it's not going to happen. So I, I can go on and on, but I won't. We emphasize that the, the role of alliances 
clearly the Armenian state thought it had a lot of alliances it could count on. It's had, it has been very uh, surprising and disappointing developments. We need to recommit, it seems to us, to a discussion around who are the strategic partners. Maybe today they're no longer the same people we had in the past. Maybe we need to look forward. For whom are we of strategic interest? What can we offer to them? This is a, a serious long-term diplomatic, strategic business effort that has to happen. We need to realize that we cannot as a country compete with large countries unless we choose certain areas in which we can achieve exponential growth. And that exponential growth uh, is going to require, require and attract human capital and financial capital. And But if we don't identify those areas where we can show that we can compete and win in and really, really focus our efforts on those, then we will be a subpar, subcritical mass country, which will lose more and more relevance. That's a choice we make. It's a hard choice, but we think that's the discussion that needs to happen. That's the eighth goal among the 15. The population itself is dwindling. We're losing our people who are leaving the country. We're also losing based on, on, on reproductive rates. Part of that has to do with, again, the future. If it's an attractive place to, to live in and to aspire to go to, then, then this will actually be partially resolved. But we also have to deal with the health challenges that are causing this and the political instability, security instability. All of this ends up showing up in the population uh, accounts as well. We need to have this Again, we say this as a goal, as an objective for discussion. This is, we don't have any answers. In none of these 15 do we have an answer, a prescription, but we have some topics that need to be discussed. I think all of us believe that we are the most educated and by far the most education, uh, uh, um, let's say committed populace in the universe. Uh, that's just not true. Um, we are, education is a big part of our lives and our culture and our heritage, but I'm afraid to say that we are losing it and we'll lose it unless we make it central again. This is not just about resting on our laurels or resting on our past, but actually making it. I don't think we're, it's ever good to say we're the best at something. I'd rather say we're the in the top 10 of countries that really value education. How do we become number three? How do we become, how do we advance, move this thing forward? And so there's a lot to do there. Um, preeminence of science, technology, and creativity. Creativity in design, in arts, in various fields where creativity is another form of inquiry, of, 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 cre of generative capability of humans. These are things that will open new directions for us. Innovation from a business standpoint comes from science, technology, and creativity. So we need to figure out where is that in our lives? Where is that in the value system in Armenia? How do we celebrate it? How do we encourage it? By the way, the diaspora is filled with Armenians that are in the science, technology, and creativity spheres, many of them top in the world. How do we get them to really engage? First step, it has to become important to the country. It cannot be that we're trying to find the three people left who are doing something and trying to preserve them. It has to be that this is central to a national strategy that people can then engage in. Governance, without good governance, none of this is possible. Without good institutions, this is not possible. And for the 20 years that I've had a chance to be involved in with Armenia in as many ways as I can, what I observe is that we think our institutions are stronger than they are. We think that our leaders know more than they do. And it's not a criticism. I know a lot less than I think sometimes, but I at least recognize it and try to get others to contribute and, and, and to learn from them Whereas I find that there's an exclusionary mood that basically almost makes it offensive to try to look for and help build a professionalism in governance. It's not about one individual, it's about the totality, how much people are getting paid, how much freedom they have to express themselves such that they can bring about change. These are things that are difficult. I don't have any answers. I'm again, don't have any background. In, in what it would take to have gov good governance, but we have a lot of work to do. And I hope that parts of the society that agree with that will take it upon themselves to bring examples from other countries. We can ask for the help of other countries in helping us lift up the capacity we have in this area. Um, and then finally, uh, equally from a governance standpoint, we need to realize that if we cannot achieve a far more just society, 
where where the the application of the of the rules and the law and the objective of eradicating poverty and and achieving a level of fairness of opportunity again these are words that are often used in a political setting i don't use it that way i'm using it to say these are projects these are initiatives that need to be on the table and and this is where people should get engaged the pop it's one thing to get popular votes for individuals it's another thing to get popular engagement in topics in goals in projects that achieve these things and so we want to make sure that just like the united nations sdgs certain elements of society all over the world commit themselves to try to keep making this better and better and they need to be given the opportunity and the tools but i think this is very important of course our heritage can't but define us it shouldn't limit us but if we lose it then we lose our uniqueness to the world and how we're doing that whether it's through our our uh, um religion our, our 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 historic role of our of our faith whether it's through our uh historic writings and our culture our teachings our language these are all things that we have done a good job at least during in the diaspora preserving but whether we're doing enough to progress and to present it to the world and to make sure it doesn't disappear especially as we're having conflicts in the region all important part and then finally and 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 importantly let me say i think in general the narrative around this has to be far more evidence based truth based we have a tendency to lose sight of reality and to talk about illusions about what we are what we used to be and how strong we are and i think it's really time especially after 2020 if 2020 taught us anything it has to be that we need to demand from leadership and from everybody diaspora our society in armenia that decision making be be driven by facts and logic and not hopes aspirations and illusions with that let me just kind of end on this slide to say to remind you as vartu he did before i pass it to her there is a website you can go to see some more information you can join you can join these events but importantly this is is not a project about any of us who have undertook taken presenting it to you it's about what you do with it and engaging with it and working towards it and i welcome that from everybody thank you so much thank you dr afian and now i'm going to group the questions and direct them to you we will start with questions about how to join the initiative uh, tigran organisation is asking how youth ngos can join and influence this initiative uh and um there is also a question about how to engage uh, government officials in this initiative so that we can translate these 15 goals into policy policies and actionable items in terms of youth and ngos joining i would suggest that you directly reach out to the future armenian initiative uh folks that that are both on this call and and can be reached uh in various ways and literally just offer to be either involved with but even more importantly to lead some of the discussions we need to have along these goals and and many of these ngos will have particular emphasis on one or another aspect maybe more than one even better and they should whether it's education whether it's health whether it's reducing inequality and they should engage and we we don't have leaders who are going to choose who gets to join we're looking for leaders literally we're looking for leaders and so I would say reaching out offering leadership offering engagement participation whatever uh we would welcome that and as far as government engagement look we know that it's it's election season in armenia and and as i said in passing with great you know kind of humility uh we can either elect individuals or we can elect the future uh we think that armenians should engage with electing the future every day of the year there should be no season to elect the future and in that regard whatever government uh, uh is in place uh and whatever whoever they put in charge of various ministries we would simply invite them to look at these same goals and to respect the will of a growing number of people who want to work towards these goals with them and if they're willing to engage it seems to me they will have a larger and larger group of educated committed people from all over the world who believe these are worth doing if i was a politician and i'm not Uh, if I was a politician, I would rather work on things that there is support for than try to get support for the things that I think are right. 
And that's why we're trying to get support and involvement for these ideas. We hope that that then influences folks in government and in the private sector to work along these dimensions in whatever way they interpret them, in whatever the way they can help them advance. Thank you. <clears throat> you emphasized uh, the importance of excellence in education and Lida Melikian and Samvel Kostanyan talked about some of the shortcomings of the current educational system in Armenia, mentioning a few issues and they are asking how would it be possible to influence higher education in Armenia uh, since the leaders of current educational institutions are not part of this initiative? Well, look, it's a good question. And, and I think that only popular support will cause them to find it in their interest to join or at least learn about this initiative. Um, look, at any given time, leaders feel threatened by any new ideas, any new people, it's a, it's a common thing throughout the world. That's not what's unnatural. But then there's sub, a subset of them who decide that continuing to lead it requires adaptation, requires, that's leadership. Adapting is a big part of leadership. Others will insist on defending the status quo against any kind of change and advancement. And, and, and that's another way, and if you have power, if you have the, 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 the control over a situation, then your status quo will prevail, but only so long. And after a while, that status quo ends up having to completely go in exchange for a new ideas and new people. So I think it's gonna be an interesting moment of choice. As I said, the leaders of these education institutions will also need to elect the future they wanna be part of. If that future looks just like today, given all the challenges we face, and given that the status quo gave us these challenges, I would say that's a less defensible position than if they elected to work towards a different future and in the process made room for new thoughts and new people. And so that's, of course, this is idealistic, but I don't know what else can be done. There's no way to kind of from top down change these things. When you're talking about ideas in a, in a, in a democratic kind of free society, you need to win the, the war of ideas. And, 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 and to do that, you need to engage in dialogue and, and persist. You have to be patient, you have to persist. So those are, that's, I'm afraid it's a long path, but look, sometimes change happens as we saw even in Armenia several years ago. Sometimes things take a lot longer to happen than we hoped, but then they happen a lot faster than we expected. That is, is a source of optimism to me because it's not like because it's taking a long time to happen, then it won't happen, then it will happen slowly. It will happen quickly. It's just a question of what does it take to get critical mass for these changes to happen. Thank you. You emphasize the importance of justice and equity uh, in your initiative. And uh, Agunik Zakarian is asking about the future of healthcare development in Armenia and how to make sure that not everything concentrates in Yerevan, but we have spread of those services uh, in all areas, including Artsakh. You know, I like questions that are themselves answers uh, because, because that I, this is exactly what this initiative is about. It's basically people uh, realizing that there's a problem, putting it forward. I would suggest that the, the facts, data get be gathered as, as per the 15th point Let's make it based on truth. Let's make it based on facts. Gather the fact, say that the following five countries that are of similar size have 35% of their resources going into the villages and into the outskirts. Whereas in Armenia, it's, it's a very different number. Get some facts put together, show that that's a source of weakness, that the health status in the periphery is, 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 is suffering as a result. I'm sure intuitively all of that is true. With those facts, with those arguments, gather a people who want to do something about it from the collective uh, uh, discussions and then take initiatives, do one or two uh, projects that are pilot projects that show how different it would be if some of these things could be shifted. I know again, that this is all easy to say, it's hard to do, but I don't know that there's a different way. The other thing we have to do is to make sure that in whatever government budgets plans are put together in the future, that a vibrant healthcare system delivery 
throughout the country in a fair way is viewed as one of the strategic assets that makes the country attractive for non-Armenians and Armenians to come to, to either visit as tourists, to live and do business there. Without that, it's just not going to be possible and it's going to hold back many other sectors of our economy. These are just arguments that I think can be made and, 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 and in some cases I think could be attractive. Harun Atorian is asking about the future of medicine and medical profession. In your opinion, what would be the most needed specialties worldwide and in Armenia in particular? Well, I must say that despite being broadly in the, in the health field from a innovation and therapeutic section, I don't profess to have a full understanding of the, of the deficiencies in our healthcare education system, meaning the areas in which we need specialists um, that, that we should emphasize. So I will you set the example of what I'm, what I'm preaching here in saying that before I can answer that question, I'd need more information at the level of Armenia. But at the level of the world, clearly we're in a period where um, one of the least attractive areas of work, infectious disease, epidemiology, vaccinology, will certainly in the future become a highly important, well-invested in part of the medical profession. Um, of course, progress is being made in neuroscience and neurology as a broad field will gain importance because the tools didn't exist in that area that exist more and more now. And again, I'm thinking more about treatments, cures, interventions, more so than, than the provision of health care, because that's, that's an area I'm less expert in. Cancer, likewise, is a field that's undergoing massive transformation with more and more effective treatments. So we're going to need folks who can actually practice the, the, the medical science, not just medicine, needed to use these advanced techniques. And then perhaps I'll say something, especially, Arthur, since you're in the public health field, one of the things that excite me, excite my colleagues at flagship pioneering here in the States is what we foresee as the emergence of a, an additional uh, component broadly of public health, although perhaps less general than public health because this could be provisioned in more uh, targeted ways. And that is what we call uh, broadly health security. We think that with this traumatic pandemic experience, uh, globally, and you will see this in the next day or two at the G7 where there will be discussions about health security. Health security, which is not only waiting till we get sick to have treatments for it, but to try to secure our health against threats, to protect, to delay, and to prevent disease as opposed to treat disease. That notion, which has historically been the purview of public health, <clears throat> really needs to be uh, redefined and brought to the world's attention because if you look at what happened in the last year, again, from Armenia, it may, I know it's devastating in Armenia as it is, but if you look at it globally, it's estimated that some $20 trillion of economic loss resulted from this tiny RNA-based virus. $20 trillion. No war, no natural disaster in 100 years. Has, has had that kind of an economic devastation, let alone human devastation, let alone health. The notion that we're going to come out of that and we're going to go back to normal in quotation and not have the realization that we have to think about our health differently. We need to think about not just in infections, but in heart disease, in diabetes, in cancer. Each of these are preceded with preconditions. We call these pre-diseases that can be identified and intervened with. Now the current medical profession, the current medical education does not really train people for that because it's generally viewed that you really need a doctor when you're sick. Well, I really foresee a doctor 30 years from now who's spending most of their effort dealing with people who are not yet sick because I think that the economics of that and the societal value of that will be even greater. However much saving people who might have died feels heroic, I'd rather prevent them getting sick uh, because to me, just like we've seen with a vaccine, how many lives has vaccine saved in the last few months? A lot more lives than any therapeutic has saved in a very, very long time. So I'm making your case for you, but 
but I really hope a subset of the medical students also think about modern, advanced, newly defined public health in the form of health security. Yeah, uh, Dr. Afen, you emphasize such important issues. Uh, and I would like to uh, move to the question about the recent uh, COVID-related vaccines as type of innovations. And unfortunately, there is lots of hesitance, uh, not only around COVID vaccine, but also any type of innovation. And Tigran Arabekian is asking, how could we overcome this kind of hesitance and barriers around any innovation? Well, I mean, that's a, it's a, a deep question and, and a question that, that holds a mirror up to just how advanced we are as a society or are not. You know, one of the illusions that, that, that we refer to in our 15 goals is the illusion that we are the most modern, most liberal thinking, most welcoming, uh, uh, you know, people and the reality is there are folks in this audience, many of them, I'm sure, that are that themselves. But as a collective, we have a conservatism, we have an orthodoxy, which is, which is not going to help us stay relevant to the world, is not going to help us stay safe. Um, and so I think the answer is education. It's education, not only formal, but educating each other. It's respect for professionals in a society professionals whose whole life work this is. Um, I think we could go to, to the church and tell clergy that we know more about religion and God than they do. And there are many people who do, by the way. We can also go to tell doctors that we know much more about medicine than they do. Or we can go and tell the, the, the conductor of the National Symphony that we know much more about. And by the way, that is part of our kind of self-absorbed cult personality. But that will hold us back. And so hesitancy often comes from either confusion or ignorance, uh, if in fact the scientific facts are there. Now, I'm not talking about all kinds of hesitancy, but in the case of a vaccine, vaccines in this space were developed with the same scientific rigor, the same testing rigor as any other vaccines been developed. The performance in many cases was far greater than vaccines that the world has taken for a long, long time. And I don't fault anybody, by the way, for being hesitant. That shows a sign of, of, of thinking. But if you stay hesitant because of either misinformation or doubt that is not based on fact, but is based on feeling like if I can doubt, then maybe I'm smarter than other people. You know, that's, I ask people, I get asked this question actually all the time. It's not just in Armenia, but basically you have the right as a private citizen to walk into uh, rush hour traffic at cars going 50 miles an hour on a highway. You have the right to do that. Uh, you break the law in doing that, but you have the right to do that. Now, why don't you, right? The hesitancy of obeying the law could also be that. But the reality is because you make the calculation that after you see a few people do that and die, that maybe that's not, that's not showing your independence quite as much. So I don't wanna seem like there's a right or wrong answer. Everybody comes to their own conclusion. But I would certainly say that hesitancy based on fact, I respect. Hesitancy based on personality or based on confusion, I think is detrimental to people's own health security. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions about uh, Moderna vaccine. Karine asks uh, whether it can become a key to anti as an anti-cancer medicine. And Burhan is asking whether it will be available in Armenia anytime soon? Sure. Um, so in terms of the application of broadly the mRNA technology, the vaccines, uh, we have applied this to cancer. And it's a, it's a long process to develop an anti-cancer vaccine. There is no such vaccine today. Um, as you may imagine, the mechanism <clears throat> is similar to vaccines against infectious disease, but it's not the same because unlike viruses that mutate, but mutate within a limited space. In cancer, the whole cell can mutate and does. And the amount of change that you see in cancers that are surviving in, in, in patients is massive. And so the immune system's ability to go after human cells and shut them down and kill them turns out to be a very, very different task 
than viruses. And that's why it's difficult. We are working on it. I'd say over the next few years, we hope to show perhaps some evidence that this can be done, but it's by no means an easy task. In terms of the question about Moderna's vaccine being able to get to Armenia, this of course has been a, 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 a difficult topic for me because I have worked for about a year to try to help that happen, uh, both with the authorities and with the international organizations. As you may know, there is no private way to buy any of the vaccines that are out there. They're sold, especially in the case of Moderna, exclusively to governments. They are not sold to private anything. And second, in the case of Moderna, it's approved only for emergency use in its sale to governments. In other words, it's illegal to sell it to individuals, to sell it to companies, to sell it to anybody but governments. In the case of Armenia and many other countries around the world, there was an entity created called COVAX. COVAX is an international body that every government agreed to be part of in order to fairly access vaccine supplies. And Armenia as well decided that it would source its vaccine through COVAX. COVAX in turn has sourced vaccines from many different companies, including Moderna, but they acted pretty slowly. In the case of Moderna, they only reached an agreement a month ago, despite our efforts for nine months to try to make sure that we have a relationship we can ship vaccines through. So yes, I think that vaccines from Moderna will reach Armenia. It will not have been early enough, uh, uh, unfortunately for me, but, but we continue to work hard on it. Look, I think that vaccinating the whole population will be an important goal. I think people who believe that 5, 10% of the people being vaccinated is enough, or that having had the disease is good enough as a, replica, a replacement of the vaccine, I'm afraid that's not what the data uh, shows. Uh, and so I hope that at a minimum, there will be vaccines at the, during the boosting phase where either to fight against variants or to fight against the original strain, people will be able to access mRNA as a booster. We're working very hard. This year, uh, Moderna will have produced a limited amount of vaccine. Next year, that number will grow to 3 billion doses. And I have no doubt that later this year, early next year, that will be a possibility. Thank you for this very hopeful news. Um, uh, Dr. Afian, I would like to ask a couple of questions about investments in Armenia and security related questions about Artsakh. Gohar Gasparian is asking, Armenia is a good country for investment, but many investors are afraid to invest in it because of the situation in Artsakh. And um, one of the goals of the future Armenians is to invest in science and technology. How do you plan to attract investments and overcoming this kind of situation? I would say that it was difficult attracting investment to Armenia before the Artsakh war, mm -hmm. the recent one, and it was not made any easier with the Artsakh war, but I think it would be a bit uh, simplifying to think that this now makes investment unattractive. I think there were reasons where people were hesitant before. I definitely think that if we had uh, some of the objectives laid out in these 15 goals implemented in Armenia three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, there would be many, many, many fold more investments because capacity from a government standpoint, uh, application of law in a fair way, emphasis on education, health, uh, science, all of those things will attract investment because they are more future looking, they are more progressive as opposed to protective and closed. And so I would say anytime we get around to adopting some of these things as central to our national strategy, the country will become more, uh, more attractive. And also if the relationship with the diaspora changes from being extractive to being mutualistic, where, where there really is a mutual interdependence and a healthy respect for what each side has to offer and its legitimacy and its strength, not just simply kind of being a source of something. I think that too will help investments because look, a lot of foreign investment benefits from having foreigners who happen to be of Armenian descent who are willing to go and live there and work there. And so if we don't engage the diaspora, I think we, we further uh, alienate the prospect there. So all of those things, and Artsakh, look, I think resolution to the, to the status of Artsakh and to its security will certainly help, but I'm afraid it will not be enough. 
Thank you. Naira Paronikian is asking, as a startup founder, I would like to ask if you are currently interested in investing in health tech, biotech, Armenian start startups. If yes, how could we present those ideas? Well, I, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, we have set up the Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology in Armenia, which is led by Armen Orujan. Uh, if you have ideas for startups and you're working in these areas, I would suggest you connect with them because I'm one of the uh, principal supporters there. And we have also set up a seed investment uh, community, the, the, uh, an angel network that is associated with FAST that is making investments in startups. And so I would suggest that people uh, uh, go through that avenue as a starting point. Lucine is asking whether you see Independent Republic of Armenia as the center of the future Armenian initiative. Independent Republic of Armenia is the nucleus of the cell that I think should describe the future Armenian. It has to be the center of many things. On the other hand, as the molecular biologists in the, in the audience know, there's also mitochondria that generate energy. It's not quite in the nucleus. There's a lot of back and forth between the, the cell surface and the nucleus. And I rather like that analogy uh, in the sense that the nucleus turns out can't control the whole cell. We thought that in biology, the nucleus is the command center for and controls everything. It does not. Everything controls each other. Evolution does not give control to one thing. It creates mutualism. And everything that can mutualistically succeed co-evolves. And that's what I think we need to do. It's, this is not just a metaphor. I really, really think that the, our government and the state of Armenia has an incredibly differentiated role to play. You don't need two nuclei, three nuclei, although there are cells that are like that. I think we can deal with one nucleus for now. Thank you very much. But we need to have a relationship where each part is dependent on the other. It's going to take a long, long time to get there. But let me just challenge everybody to just think for a second. You know, we live, the Ar Armenians lived the last hundred years largely feeling the result of the genocide. Many other things too, but largely under the weight of what happened when they were basically spread all around the world and forced to get into survival mode before they could start standing up again. The effect of the genocide was that it not only killed people, but it disintegrated the rest. It fragmented the rest. And yes, there was a small piece that was reconstituted in, the, in, our, in what became the Armenian Republic 100 years ago and, and, and survived under Soviet rule for 100 years. But one of the things that I think the part of future Armenian goal has to be is to reconstitute Armenians. It will be the best answer to the genocide. It will be a reversal of the genocide. You cannot bring the people back. But what you can do is to use the destructive power of the genocide to reconstruct what it is to be connected, respectful of each other. You know, if we cannot simply find celebrities, you know, I, I love Enik Mkhitaryan and I follow him and Aronian and the other day I had a chance to speak with Gary Kasparov, who, by the way, is supportive of this initiative and signed to join. I love these names, but that is not reconstitution. We need to be proud of the least accomplished person in our community. That's reconstitution. And so I really, this may sound again romantic, I'm sorry, but hey, you're young. You can all afford to be more romantic. Older people kind of accumulate disappointments and lose that spirit. But I would say that we have to set out a goal that at least 30, 40, 50 years from now, we have to operate far more like we operated historically as one collective group that have common missions and goals than we have been forced to do after what happened to us over the last century. So, such an important advice to our young people, given this, all these difficulties that we face in 2020, I, I hope our young people don't um, go back to the victim's identity because your initiatives helped a lot to overcome and build confidence. So I hope we, uh, they will take it seriously, this uh, advice from you. Uh, there, there might be some couple of random questions. We have four minutes left. Um, 
uh, from the audience. Uh, for example, Larissa Zakarian has been asking, you know, after uh, our soldiers have been amputated, they have many wounds, uh, would it be possible to kind of grow body parts uh, from the genetic material? What do you think about this kind of future? Yeah, I mean, it's something that, that we've looked at and worked on for many years in the biotechnology field is basically regenerative medicine. And I don't know actually what the state of the art is in that area. There are advances being made. Uh, of course, there are other prosthetic uh, ways in which we've made even more advances. And so, yes, I think in the, in the future, in the distant future, even while we learn more and more about stem cells and differentiation, this is something that people are working on. <clears throat> we have, for example, projects, it's not going to help the injured, but we have projects, for example, where we're trying to, to make enough hepatocytes to basically deal with liver failure in a way where we could implant essentially a, a natural liver, but not uh, in, in its place, uh, simply to do some amount of the work that a failed liver cannot do just to save people until they can get a transplant. Things like that are being worked on, but I think that is a very exciting field. And one would have to look at what's the state of the art and what can be actually used versus being tried still in early stage. Um, there is, we have a question even about the Putin-Biden meeting. Karine is asking what we should expect. Will they talk about Armenian issues? Uh, I wish I knew uh, the answer to that. I have heard that the Erdogan-Biden meeting will have Armenian issues on it. And I believe that President Biden will raise some of the concerns that are being made in Armenia vis-a-vis Azerbaijan's kind of indiscriminate violation of Armenia's sovereignty, as well as what happened in Artsakh, even while I'm sure President Erdogan will try to convince President Biden that recognizing the genocide uh, is not in its, in its interest, uh, even after it's happened. So, but I think, I think with, with President uh, Putin, it's a, uh, or Prime Minister Putin, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult moment in our history vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relations. I think everybody knows that, and I hope that there'll be a way to agree on at least a couple of things, even while there's probably gonna be disagreement on just about everything else. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to say any concluding remarks? Uh, before I'll thank we the adjourn? audience. I'll thank the audience for their time. Um, it, it is interesting and maybe I'll leave you with one future oriented thought. I'm sure that the format of our meeting is odd. On the other hand, without this, we wouldn't be able to talk because I'm not able to travel to Armenia given the restrictions we have both here and there. Um, and, and, and yet looking to the future, the more we can have connections like this, as well as in person, the more we will be able to hear each other. I could only hear you today through Vartuhi's expert uh, moderation. Thanks a lot for that. Vartu, you did a great job. It's but my pleasure, time, thank you. Yeah, but at the same time, look, look at the evidence here of how Armenians from around the world are able to talk about the same uh, topic. And, and so I think we should embrace the new approaches, the new technologies, and use that to get together and work towards a common objective. I, I really encourage everyone here to, to engage in some way. I think that if we can work on the future, the present will get better. If we only work on the present, I'm very deeply concerned about the future. Thank you so much. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you, everyone. And good luck with everything.